प्लीज गो एट सर वी आर लाइव नाउ Good morning to all of you, and good morning to Dia. Dia has joined us today from very distant place. Thank you very much, Dia, for joining us uh, today for this session. Ladies and gentlemen, after a challenging period, it started in last March, and one tested the spirit and resolve of the mankind. things seems to be looking up with the infection rate ebbing and vaccination drive continuing on a mission mode with ongoing festivities and the new year round the corner positive sentiment is high and we see life moving towards greater normalcy with the hope to build a stronger and resilient nation i welcome you to yet another webinar on atmanirbhar bharat moving towards self reliant india a leadership session organized by shm to my mind our honorable prime minister's clarion call on atmanirbhar bharat towards a self reliant india cannot be achieved without women playing a much greater role with nearly 50% of the population comprises of female clearly states that unless and until they become much bigger part of the system all round and effective development would remain a distant dream right from their participation in our freedom struggle to their contribution in uplifting education art literature culture sports medicine science and technology r and d business women of this country have shown phenomenal resilience passion and commitment towards family society and the country some indian women are global leaders and powerful voices in diverse fields but at the same time several women in india do not fully enjoy many of their rights due to deeply entrenched patriarchal views norms tradition and structures our country cannot progress without strengthening the socio economic status of women honorable prime minister shri narendra modi accorded top priority to this issue by launching the beti bachao beti padhao campaign in 2015 which aims to generate awareness and improve the efficiency of welfare services intended for girls in india the government of india has launched several initiatives to promote gender equality and prosperity while increasing its workforce participation while india has taken significant steps in this direction its global standing on gender equality leaves a lot to be desired india's ranking in global gender gap report commissioned in 2018 had a ranking of 108 which has further declined to 112 in 2020 hence each one of us individually have collective responsibility towards ensuring a better life and livelihood for them our guest this evening has fiercely fearlessly has fiercely challenged gender norms and is associated with the cause of female empowerment in india president of india's national ambassador 
for the Save the Daughter, Educate the Daughter campaign. She has been a strong advocate for girl rights. Please join me in welcoming Dia Bajaj. Ms. Dia Bajaj is a Cornell educated, internationally recognized adventurer, speaker, business leader, and founder of a nonprofit. Ganga Vatika Home for Girls. She has climbed six of the seven summits, highest mountain on each continent, and is part of the first father daughter duo to summit Mount Everest from North Side. She is the President of India's National Ambassador, as I mentioned, for the Save the Daughter, Educate the Daughter campaign, and as reached over 10 million people through videos, talks, and media appearances. She has been a strong advocate for girl rights in India. Ms. Dia Bajaj is Director, Operation and Business Development at Snow Leopard Adventures. She is also a consultant with the Adventure Nature Nation, where she created standard operating safety procedure for 25 partner companies in order to reduce accident rates in adventure activities. I can go on and on talking about Dia. She has so many credentials and credits to her account. She has been speaking at several events and as I read, over 150 plus events at schools, NGOs, and social forums to spread awareness about climate change and pursuing passion regardless of the gender. He has delivered two TEDx talks, The Spirit of Adventure in 2018 and Beyond Everest in 2019. She has been recipient of many accolades in 2019, she was featured as Pandora's Women of the Year and Chandigarh Rotary Club's Shreyas Award for challenging gender norms and successfully climbing, as I mentioned earlier, Mount Everest. Dia Bajaj has made adventure a mission in her life. She is an example of how to not just survive but enjoy challenges and pressures. So when she speaks about dreaming big and working hard to make those dreams come true, is truly her personal experience. Also her views on female empowerment, decision-making, out-of-the-box thinking, and handling adversity are likely to inspire, motivate, and energize many participants in their quest to achieve their goals. We are delighted to have her with us today. And without much ado, I will now request Ms. Bajaj to address the webinar. Over to you, Dia Jai Hind. Thank you so much, Anil, sir, for that warm introduction. Very, very excited to be here and to be speaking to all of you today. And today I'm going to actually be taking you on a journey to Mount Everest. And I'm going to be showing you pictures and videos of what it was like to be a part of that journey. Um, can all of you see the screen? Yes. Um, great. And you should be able to see this slide, correct? The first slide. Great. Okay, well, um, my journey with, with climbing started when I was very, very young. To give you a little bit of context, my father was the first Indian to ski to the North and the South Pole. And so adventure and the outdoors has always been a very big part of my life. Our family holidays would be 
climbing somewhere, kayaking somewhere, hiking somewhere. And that's always just the way it was. When, you know, this is just a small example of some of the things that we would do together as a family. So this is actually a video of me, my father and my younger sister, all scuba diving. <laughs> So it was actually my mom's birthday and we did an underwater dance for her to say happy birthday. And, uh, you know, the adventures continued. When I was 14 years old, I went on my first major expedition. This was a sea kayaking expedition along the coast of Greenland, where we spent 14 days kayaking amongst icebergs. I was only 14 at that time. And to be away from home, to be living in these very, very cold, difficult conditions with absolutely no access to the outside world was was very challenging, but it was very, very fun as well. I realized I absolutely love, you know, being outdoors and completely having no connection with the outside world and cooking for yourself and carrying everything you need in those kayaks. Um, when we were at Greenland, I remember dad and I decided that we would come back to Greenland. We saw the Greenland ice cap, which is absolutely beautiful. And when I was 17, came back to attempt skiing across the Greenland ice cap which was a journey of 550 kilometers, um, 21 days. Both dad and I, we were gonna be the first Indians to do this and I was gonna be the youngest in the world to attempt this event. We did finally make it across and of course unfurling our Indian national flag at the end of the expedition was an incredible experience. But what made it all the more special was that right before the expedition, we had actually had the chance to see a children's home. At that time, that was only for boys. And when I visited this home and asked them, you know, why is this only for boys? The, the management said, you know, we're worried about taking the responsibility of bringing in girls. And of course, you know, to be 17 and been, I'm ne I had never been told in my life that I can't do something because I'm a girl. I was very, very fortunate to have grown up in a family which really supported my dreams and said, it doesn't matter, you know, what your gender is. If you're passionate about something, you have to pursue it. And so when I went to this children's home and they said, Ki, you know, we don't, we only want um, boys because we're worried about the responsibility of getting girls in. Uh, I, of course, was extremely upset. And with the help of my parents, we managed to convince the management that, listen, you have to bring in girls. And they said, okay, we'll bring in girls if you bring in the money. So we actually used this expedition, being the youngest in the world and being the first two Indians, we had had a little bit of media coverage. So what we did was we used that little bit of media, media coverage to actually um, tell everyone that, listen, pledge some money for every kilometer that we ski. So even if people were pledging one or two rupees, having skied 550 rupees, it became 550 rupees or 1,100 rupees. So like that, we were able to piece together about 10 lakhs of rupees, which at that time at 17 was, you know, the most life-changing amount. And it really was, we were able to bring in 12 little girls into the home. And that's when I realized that, you know, there is something to be said about not only being passionate about something, but to use that passion to make an impact. And I realized that whatever, however small the impact is, there's no better feeling, right? All these records and things, they come and go, but when you can truly impact a life, that's when you feel good about it. And that's when you feel like you've truly made a difference. So the adventures continued, dad and I, my graduation, my high school graduation gift was a climb to Mount Elbrus, which is the highest mountain in Europe. And from then on, then I went to college and over there also every single minute that I got, I would go out and spend, you know, outside. Of course, it was a very, very difficult curriculum. But when you are passionate about something, you will always take the time out to go and do it. Right. So I went and would be whitewater kayaking, skiing, hiking, doing whatever I could to spend some time outdoors. And it was while I was here, dad came to visit me and we both started talking about all of our expeditions together. And I don't even remember who brought it up, but one of us mentioned Mount Everest. See, the thing is, when you grow up in the field of adventure, Mount Everest is 
always something that is at the back of your mind. Every book that you read, every movie that you watch has some mention of Sagar Mata, Jomulangma, or Mount Everest, as she's called in English. And there is something magical and mystical about just even thinking about it. So dad and I decided that, listen, we're going to try and attempt climbing Mount Everest. Now, both of us were experienced mountaineers. I had done my mountaineering courses from the Nehru Institute of Mountaineering, both basic and advanced. Dad had also done his mountaineering courses. But we spent two years climbing or training to climb Mount Everest. Now, this is what the, the north face of Mount Everest looks like. We decided to climb from the north side. So the north side is the China or Tibet side, not the Nepal side. Nepal side is where you hear a majority of climbers climbing from. Uh, this is the side that Sir Ed and Tenzing Sherpa also climbed from. And um, we decided to climb from the north side, which is the other side. Now, the reason why we decided to climb from here is because even though it's steeper, colder, and more physically challenging, we also felt that it's a little bit safer because you don't have to cross the Khumbu ice fall. Also, because it's steeper, there's less chance of snow accumulating in places, and so there's less avalanche danger as well. Now, when we had to convince my mom to let half of her family go out on this expedition, which doesn't have the best reputation, um, saying that it was a little bit safer definitely helped us out just a little bit. So when I say we spent two years training for Mount Everest, the two years consisted of doing cardio every possible like minute that we were free. So literally four hours a day, two hours before work, two hours after work, we would be doing some sort of cardio exercise, whether that was swimming, um, running, cycling, anything to keep ourselves fit. We also did four practice expeditions. Uh, the first one to Ladakh, we climbed a beautiful mountain, mountain called Kangyatse. We then went to Nepal and did um, along the route of Everest base camp from the Nepal side. And then, but we veered off a little towards the end and went to this beautiful lake called Gokyori. Um, then we went to France and did a lot of technical training. This is actually me climbing up a frozen waterfall. And then the fourth and final expedition was back to Ladakh where we actually had the opportunity to see the beautiful snow leopard. And as some of you might know, seeing the snow leopard is one of the most rare experiences, right? They're called the gray ghost of the Himalayas. So getting to see the snow leopard right before our expedition almost felt like a good sign, a good omen. And then after two years of eating, sleeping, breathing Mount Everest, we finally, finally made it. This is what camp looks like, base camp looks like from the north side. And as you can see, you can see the summit of Mount Everest right ahead of us. And it was absolutely magnificent. At this point, let me mention, a lot of people talk about conquering mountains or conquering mother nature. They say, Dia, now that you've climbed Mount Everest, you've conquered it, right? And the one thing that I would like to say is that at the end of the day, it doesn't matter you know you can't use these words because us humans when we look at this big beautiful mountain in front of you you realize how small and how insignificant we are you realize if anything we're fortunate to have the opportunity to be over here right it's there's no such thing as conquering a mountain and there's no such thing as conquering mother nature this is a little prayer ceremony that we had before we actually moved further up the mountain and again it's not about the religious aspect of this, especially in this context, right? It was a Buddhist prayer ceremony. It doesn't matter what religious ceremony it was. What was important was that you're taking that time out to say you're showing your respect to the mountain. And that's one thing that is so, so important while climbing. Because the minute you start thinking that you're bigger and better than the mountain, that's when the accidents happen. And that's when you stand to lose limb or worse, life. This is what the route up to the summit looks like. And uh, to give you a little bit of context, right? The reason why an, a journey to Mount Everest takes anything from six to eight weeks is because if you were to find a magical helicopter that took you directly to the summit and you got off, you would die within four and a half minutes. 
And the reason why that happens is because the concentration of oxygen up at the summit is so low that our bodies won't be able to deal with it. So what you have to do is you actually have to slowly move up the mountain. So you actually spend 10 days at base camp, then you climb a little further, you spend a week at advanced base camp, climb a little further, spend a night at North Call, climb a little bit further, and then climb all the way back down. Now you're basically acclimatized till here, and beyond this point, you're actually using supplemental oxygen to climb. At base camp, you then, so once you acclimatize till here, you come all the way back down to base camp, and you actually spend um, about a week to two weeks waiting for a good weather window. So you need to know that the weather is going to be clear for 10 days. You need 10 clear days to then go do your summit attempt. Up till advanced base camp, yaks go. So up till here, you can actually have yaks that take a lot of your equipment up. Everything beyond that, you're carrying everything on your back yourself. Um, this is what advanced base camp looks like. And you can see the reasons why yaks can't go beyond here is because of this giant wall of ice and snow. Um, the climbing beyond advanced base camp becomes rough. It's tough, difficult, uh, very, very steep. For every three steps you take, you have to stop and take a break. You can see this is what the climbing looks like. And these are what some of the views look like. So as you can see, you're attached to a rope throughout at this point, even if you, once you reach camp one, if you need to leave your tent to go out and pee or anything, you have to use a rope. Um, because on one side over here to the left is actually a huge crevasse that goes down into the middle of nowhere. And on the right, there's the steep drop right back to advanced base camp. And so the climbing continued and it was actually now we're moving from camp to camp one to camp two. That's about 7,300 meters um, to 7,800 meters where we faced, we were wearing supplemental oxygen now. And it was here that we faced one of the most scary moments on the mountain. The wind speeds were so high that it almost felt like we were going to be blown off the face of the earth. It was so cold, minus 40 degrees Celsius with the wind chill, that it was difficult to even take another step forward. It's at times like this where it's very easy to want to give up and say, listen, I can't do this anymore. But it's also at times like this where you realize how important it is to stay positive. You have to remind yourself that, you know, you're here for this, you've trained for this. And if anything else, you have to remember to be positive and to be good to yourself. In situations like this, it's just very easy. You just want to give up. You want to just say, why? Why am I doing this to myself, right? The minute you start thinking like that, that's when you've lost your summit. That's when your journey long, no longer has any purpose. What you need to do is to think positive. You know, imagine yourself back at camp with a cup of hot chocolate in your hands, or better yet, Imagine yourself at the summit unfurling the national flag, right? If you think about those positive things during times of difficulty, that's what gets you through it. We did make it past the storm and it, the storm literally was raging all night. We finally di it died down about 5.30 a.m. and we got a couple of hours of sleep. And that morning at 8.30 a.m. we left for our next camp. And uh, you reach camp three and it's very, very beautiful, but it's very, very high up now. You're almost at 8,100, 8,200 meters. And when you're up here, you actually only spend six hours resting at camp. And then you get up, you eat a little bit, and then you leave for the summit attempt at 8 p.m. at night. So we're only at that camp for about 10 hours trying to rest. But of course, at that altitude, you can't really, you don't feel like eating. You don't feel like sleeping. Your body is basically um, anything above 8,000 meters is called the so-called death zone, right? It's where your body is slowly decreasing in functioning and, and the human body is struggling to sort of adapt to those conditions. But let me tell you, the one thing about that camp was the view. It was one of the most incredible views I've ever seen.
We are literally above the clouds and it's absolutely gorgeous. So as I mentioned, you leave at 8 p.m. at night and this is because the conditions on the mountain are more stable at night. And this is what climbing at night looks like. This is climbing up the second ladder. The second step, this is climbing up. Uh, at night, you can see we, it's very cold, very dark. All you can see is the path ahead of you. And at this point, you know, we had been climbing well, we'd been climbing strong. Everything had been going according to plan. When all of a sudden, you know, we're about half an hour away from the summit and dad turns to me and he says, Dia, I can't breathe. What had happened was his oxygen mask had stopped working. And it was a very, very scary moment. Now, when you're climbing, right, the minute you stop moving, you become cold very, very fast because your body isn't generating heat anymore. And it was a very, very scary moment for the both of us because dad said, listen, what should, you know, dad was like, yeah, you keep climbing. The path was too narrow for both of us to stop together. And so I could either keep going forward or turn back, but I couldn't stand there and wait with him. And for dad, it was a no brainer. He said, yeah, you go forward. At that point, after being awake for so long, climbing in the middle of the night and almost being so close to the summit, your brain is really fuzzy headed. And there wasn't much time to actually think about this decision. And so very, very reluctantly, I kept moving forward with a very bad feeling in my heart and um, I actually ended up reaching the summit while it was still dark outside it was about 4 30 in the morning and I was sitting right below the summit and it didn't even hit me that I had reached right I was so worried and so nervous about dad and then the most magical thing happened just as the sun started to rise on Mount Everest I saw dad walking towards me and it was literally one of the most beautiful moments as both dad and I then hugged at the summit of Mount Everest. And um, okay. we're on top of the world. And of course, unfurling our Indian national flag together was a very, very beautiful moment. Um, we climbed as India's first father daughter team to climb Mount Everest. And the reason why I share this with you is not because, you know, we climb for the records. We don't climb for the records. We climb for the climb. But climbing as India's first father-daughter team was important because as Mr. Anil sir very, very rightly mentioned, right now, India is only using 50% of its workforce. Us girls, us women, we can do so much. Right? We're capable of really, really taking our country to heights beyond imagination. But we can do a lot. I feel like we can do a lot more if our families are there as a pillar of support and strength for us. Our families also need to believe in us. And this is not only something that us girls have to do by ourselves. It's what we have to do as a country. We all have to work hard to uplift our women and do something positive to make a change. And so climbing as India's first father-daughter team was important because we wanted to spread this message that, look, families, us girls, we can do so much. Us daughters can do so much. But we can do a lot more if our families are there with us. And so that, of course, was a very, very special moment, unfurling our national flag, knowing that we had such a strong message behind it. Of course, the happiness, the euphoria and the excitement lasted exactly seven minutes because we realized, OK, we've reached up, but now we've got to go back down. And the going back down part is a lot more scary because all of a sudden you can actually see everything, right? It's daylight and you can see how steep the drops are and how scary it really is and here's a little video to give you some context <laughs>
So you can see how steep it is and how dangerous and narrow the paths are. A lot of the accidents in mountaineering happen actually while going back down because people lose their focus. They think, okay, we've made it up the mountain. Now we don't have to concentrate anymore. But actually, it's not only reaching the top. That's your objective. It's reaching the top and coming back down safely. This is some of the pictures of the coming down. Um, and of course, we were very fortunate to have made it down without any issues, but of course, things can go wrong. This is a picture of another climber that got a really, really bad case of frostbite because he kept taking his gloves off to smoke a cigarette. And um, eventually, uh, he got such a bad case of frostbite that all 10 of his fingers needed to be amputated when he went back into Kathmandu. So things can go wrong. You know, you can't take Mother Nature lightly. And even the smallest mistakes can have very, very big consequences in these situations. It's important to note. The adventures have continued. Dad and I are on a quest to climb the seven summits, which is the highest mountain in every continent. We're only left with one, which is Denali in North America. And hopefully we do plan on attempting that later next year in the summer. Um, but finally, you know, I, I would just like to end with a couple of takeaways. Being an adventure my whole life, I have learned a couple of things. And I think there are three essential things that you need to get to the top, right? And of course it comes in a great acronym, P-O-P. Um, the first thing in top is team, right? And team are the people around you. Team is society, team is your well-wishers, right? Team is anyone in your life that gives you support, that gives you a positive outlook. They're, they're the people who wish well for you. They're the people who energize you after you speak to them. And if anything, you have to keep your team close. There is no sub substitute for a good support system. And I strongly, strongly believe in that. The thing is, you know, a lot of us, when we were um, stuck in our homes during COVID, when we were facing challenging times, the people around us, it was easy to start getting frustrated with them, right? Because they're the only people you see. But the one thing I will say is, remember that those people around you are your support system. So you have to be the kindest to them. Be the kindest to the people that are around you and that love you. And secondly, also, if someone is giving you a lot of support and strength, you must do the same for them. You must also be there for them. And, and at the end of the day, there is nothing more important than a team. You realize that when you're at some of the most difficult conditions, your life depends on your team. And it's not only the people who are around you at that moment. For me, while I'm out on expeditions, I know it's the love and the strength that I would feel from my sister, my mom, my grandparents, that would also keep me going during some of the most difficult times. Dad, of course, was with me. Finally, so the T in, is team, O is outlook. Um, by outlook, I mean, what you have to do is whenever you're in a difficult situation, life is going to throw many storms at you. You're going to be in situations where it's difficult and it's going to be extremely, extremely challenging. You have to focus on the positives. You have to think of only the good in those situations, because the minute you start focusing on the negatives, you're going to bring your entire morale down. The second thing is that essentially, we can't change what happens to us, right? We can't change the storms that come to us in our lives, but what we can change is how we react. So that's the important thing to remember. None of us could change the fact that COVID was something that hit our entire country, but we could change how we reacted did we volunteer? Did we do the right thing and stay at home? Did we wear masks? All of those things, you know, we can change how we did we use the time that we say weren't weren't um, expected to commute or expected to go out. Did we use that time productively? Those are things that we can change. And so those are the things that you must change whenever you're faced in any adverse situation. How do you work to get out of it? What can you do to change that situation? Finally, P is plan. There is no substitute for hard work and preparation, right? And I love this quote. It's the harder I practice, the luckier I get. 
the reason why I told you about those four practice expeditions and how much time we spent training for Mount Everest is because I strongly believe that preparing hard is a very, very essential part of actually getting to the top. And finally, of course, having a strong plan. So it's very, it's very easy to have this abstract idea that I'm going to make it to the summit of Mount Everest, but to plan out that entire journey. So practice and planning essential parts of getting to the top. With that, I would like to conclude by saying that all of you today have the world at your feet. Right? There's absolutely nothing that us Indians can't do. And we, I know, within the next few years are all going to be changing the world. I strongly believe that armed with a strong team, a great outlook and a good plan, all of you will achieve wonders. So here's wishing you happiness, health and success much, much higher than Mount Everest. Thank you. Thank you, Dia. It's been most fascinating talk that I've heard in the last few days. There is absolutely no doubt, at least in my mind, that Indian girls are much superior to Indian boys in every which way. Indian girls have made all of us proud in every field that they have come forward. And there are numerous examples that I can actually share with you. Whether the PepsiCo head Indra Nui or Kalpana Chawla now who went to the space. When, and all these people <clears throat> have been making not only proud to us in India, but all over the globe. And there are many. India is a country actually where we had first Prime Minister Indira Gandhi to lead our country and demonstrate it to the world that she is an iron lady. <clears throat> In sports, recently, <clears throat> in Olympics, Indian girls have made us all feel very proud. So, every Indian, or whoever is listening to us today, must pass on this message that Indian girls are not anywhere, in any way, less competent than Indian boys. If not more, they at least equal to them in every which way. Although I, I have my personal view, which is slightly different. So what message would you want to give? Although you gave several messages in your talk, where you said that your family was your greatest support system. They encouraged you. So people who are listening, I think it's a takeaway from them that all of us have to change our mindset that our girls can do all those things that only many people think boys can do. So what, what in your view, other than team and planning that you mentioned, dedication and commitment that you highlighted in your speech, that you will want to tell the audience today uh, uh, that they should do going forward for the girls? I would say that all of us have a responsibility to the women in our lives and that we have to work hard to uplift them. It's very easy, um, you know, so to all the women out here, to all the girls over here listening, you must, must work hard and reach to the highest of heights in your professional careers 
you know, all of us have our own Everest to climb. So reach those Everests and make it to the top and do it not only for yourself, but do it for all the other girls in India. You Remember that you're doing it not only for yourselves, but to be an example. And for all the men and for all the boys listening to us, it's very easy to listen to a talk and feel inspired, but you must also put that into action. You must support your sisters, daughters, mothers, aunts, whoever it is, support the women in your family when they have a dream, you know, listen to them, give them that respect, the same respect you would give to a boy saying a similar thing, whether it's in sports, whether it's in music, whether it's in whatever it is that they want to do. Support the people around you and be there, be there, be advocates, right? So it's not only the women that have to work hard, but it's the men who also have to support. And it's it's a it's a dual thing, right? Both of us have to work together to to move forward in this um, in this field and and make a difference. Uh, thank you, Dia. Uh, what message would you want to give to the Indian corporate world? What they need to do <clears throat> for the uh, women uh, in their in their organizations to to kind of support them to 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 encourage them and to give them their rightful place in in their organizations um this of course is is uh when it when it comes to corporates it's of course a very very big topic and there is lots that can be done um but I think it just it eventually starts with equality and giving and, you know, not only talking about equality, but putting it into practice. So you need to have more women in leadership positions. You need to not penalize women for, you know, taking um, like maternity leave. And in fact, I think the one way to actually equalize this would be to give both maternity and paternity leave mandatory so that people stop thinking that, uh, you know, it's only women who take time off. I think uh, men also need to understand that they need to be a part of the child raising process. And uh, I'm very, very lucky to have had parents who both very equally, you know, took that time out to do that. So I would say that that Indian corporates, you need to change the way you're thinking. We need to have more women in leadership positions. And um, we just need to figure out how to get more representation of women out there and give them more opportunities. <clears throat> Our Prime Minister has been talking a lot about Beti Badao, Beti Badao, Beti Bachao. And um, there are statistics to say that in some states, uh, gender ratio has also improved and so on and so forth. Uh, in addition to this, uh, what do you think government of India needs to do uh, to, to have more gender equality? So um, we actually met our honorable president right after we summited Mount Everest. And uh, one of the things that we spoke to him about, we, we, you know, we were very, very fortunate to have been facilitated at the, felicitated at the Rashtrapati Bhavan. One of the things we spoke to him about was actually this Beti Padao, Beti, um, Beti Bachao, Beti Padao Andolan. And we joked and we said, you know, it should be Beti Bachao, Beti Padao. And Beti ko Everest Chidao. And that being symbolic of moving beyond now, just saving our daughters and educating our daughters, we need to support our daughters and help them reach, you know, their their highest, highest achievements. So I think now we need to move beyond just saving and educating. We need to actually, you know, give our daughters the, the confidence and the strength to move beyond that and now start achieving things and achieving great heights in their personal and professional careers. Um, you know, I, I see that you are also engaged in business. Uh, many lessons uh, that you have carried from your uh, adventure into your uh, business environment. So what uh, lessons that you would want to share with people uh, young people to become business leaders tomorrow? Um, 
I would say there's 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 multiple multiple many many learnings and I did share a little bit um, previously. But one of the things that I will say is number one, you know, work hard. So you have to put in the hard work, right? There is no there is no shortcut to the top. And you need to need to put be ready to put in that effort and hard work if you want to reach, you know, anywhere in your in your corporate career. The second thing is also not only working hard, which is important, but working smart. So make sure that um, you know you are working in a way that is efficient and maximizing the um, maximizing the amount of effort you put in, right? So. For example, it's not only I you can sit or you can you can train for Mount Everest say every day for four hours. But what I could do is just walk around the park. But that isn't really I'm working hard. I'm still working for four hours, but I'm not working smart, right? So like by changing up uh, changing up the different activities you're doing or changing up the um, the strength and effort you're putting in. Um, that's working smart. Working smart is making sure that you're being efficient with your time and your resources. So it's not only about working hard, it's about working smart and you've got to do both. Um, I would say that it's also, we live in an era of instant gratification, right? The minute we want something, you open up Facebook, you can, you open up Instagram and you immediately, you open up Google. If you want information, you open up Google and you get it, right? If you want food, you, you open up your app and you get it. It's just very easy to get frustrated when the minute we want something, we don't get it. But when it comes to our careers and when it comes to our lives, a little bit of patience is very, very important. There are times on the mountain where you're just stuck in a tent and can't move out for days on end, right? And it's very frustrating because you're so fit, you're so ready to climb. And then you just have to wait in a tent for days on end till the weather becomes better. And you realize that patience is a very, very important part of the process. So you have to work hard, work smart, and then be patient and understand that the results aren't going to come within a day or two. It might take months, it might take years, but when the result comes, it will feel very, very good. And finally, I talk about this a lot, but just stay positive. We're going to face many, many setbacks in our lives. And that is life, right? If everything went well and everything was great all the time, um, th there would be no purpose, right? So it is life is about strife and it is about uh, facing challenges and facing lows, but it's about coming off them stronger. And so... The, the third and final thing would be to remain, keep that positive outlook, stay strong, stay steady in your beliefs with the understanding that that success and happiness will come. Um, I think I think those would be my, my biggest takeaways that I feel are very applicable to the business world as well. Uh, yeah, as most people say that India lives in the villages of this country. And we have a very large women living in the rural India. So what, what message would you want to give it to them? That they come out of the cocoon that they are living and take center stage for, for their own growth and development and for the development of this country. I think it will all firstly begin with education. And so to take your studies, you know, take the studies seriously, understand that that a lot can be learned from from education. And, and actually, I think that is one step to moving towards a more um, progressive India where we support our women. Um, and the second thing I will say is believe in yourselves. And even if everyone else is telling you that, do not. I think the the strength and the resilience comes from within. So to take that second, to take that minute, take a deep breath and say, I can do this. You know, there'll always be people who say you can't, but if you believe you can, you can. Thank you very much, uh, Dia. It's been nice uh, talking to you. And I'm sure everybody who has joined um, may have taken copious notes of all that you have shared, because there are not one, there are multiple lessons. 
and there are many lessons for all of us uh, to take it forward in the corporate world or from the chambers to the, to the government moving forward to, to achieve uh, our uh, goal of a very, very self-reliant India. And self-reliance can only come when 100% of the labor force of this country is productive, efficient, and delivering in unison to achieve our superordinate goal. Thank you very much and all the very best. Thanks again for joining us so early in the morning. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye -bye. you, dear man. Thank you, Anil, sir. Bye. Bye.